Hello, physics people. We are uh, we're going to talk about two manifestations of a similar phenomenon here, and we're going to start with an analogy to the main topic we're trying to touch on um, in this presentation. So let me just get into it. Let's say that here's the only object in the universe. The universe is devoid of all things except for this one single object. What does this object do? Well, object denotes something for sure. It denotes the fact that this is massive. All right. Um, what does this massive object do? Well, for sure, no matter what, um, this creates gravitational field G everywhere in space around it. All right, Einstein would say that this mass deflects the space-time plane. Uh, space -time plane. Um, okay, fine. Uh, now, how strong is this field? How strong is this field? Well, that depends. It depends on a couple of things. One, mass of the object. Two, distance from M's center, all right? Um, we call that R. So um, what does this gravitational field do? Well, nothing. If this is the only object in the universe, the field doesn't do anything except, well, really it does nothing. The field is there. The field is, as Einstein would say again, a deflection in the fabric of space-time. Um, so it doesn't do anything unless the field can, well, exert a gravitational force on some other mass placed in the field. That says in. This says field. Oh, boy. So now we've rid ourselves of this limitation of a single object. We're saying in order for this field to do anything of interest, there must be some other mass that's, say, placed here. And sometimes what you'll hear is, you'll hear referred to as like, you know, a little mass as opposed to our big mass M, all right? Um, now we say that some of us, maybe as a sort of review, the gravitational field made by mass m depends on, well, the universal gravitational constant and m's mass and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from m's center. All right, so that's an equation that some of us by now have seen in terms of gravitational field strength. And thus, if we put a, if we put a, uh, a mass here, there's a gravitational force exerted on mass m, and we can write that force in a couple of ways. We can write it as, well, little m times the strength of the gravitational field. But here's our strength of the gravitational field, so we can write this as g times big M times little m over r squared, and we recognize that as the expression for, um, well, universal gravitation. Okay, what we haven't shown, but it is true, is, well, little mass m feels that gravitational force Fg. Well, so does big M. These two things exert forces, a force pair on each other, uh, or they are, those forces are part of a force pair. Um, but when we, what we usually don't necessarily bother talking about is the fact that well, if little m is in space, little m makes a gravitational field too, and that gravitational field exerts a force on mass big M. Worth mentioning, but sometimes we gloss over that. All right, um, now, what we can do is we can make a representation of the gravitational field that mass big M makes if we say, yeah, but what if, <clears throat> what if I put mass m here or here or here or here or here or anywhere else, we could say, well, you know, what does the field do to that mass? Well, no matter where we put that mass, the field made by mass big M is going to exert an inward or radially inward force on mass little m. And thus, 
the field, the gravitational field that Big M makes can be represented with a bunch of uh, uh, mag, uh, 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 gravitational field vectors. So this is a representation of the gravitational field made by mass M. It shows us a couple things. It shows us that you know, the field that mass M makes is always toward mass M. And it shows us that we can tell where the field is weaker and stronger. You know that the field is stronger the closer you are to mass big M. And notice that the closer we are to mass M, the more densely packed these lines are. And the farther away we are from mass M, the farther apart those lines get. I'm not talking about a measure of an angle here. I'm just quite literally talking about you know, lines per unit area. We call that field line density. And that gives us a visual representation of how strong a field is, in this case, a gravitational field. All right, so that's maybe some review to set the stage for a different kind of question. All right, but maybe similar. So when we talk about electrostatics, we say, I mean, we could almost extend this question. What is a single, what does the only object in the universe do? Well, it definitely, because it's an object, because it is by definition massive, creates a gravitational field. But maybe that object happens to have a non-zero net charge. So it's therefore a charge. I mean, it's an object still. Let's put aside the gravitational um, field effect that this, this, this thing has. Let's say that it's charged. Well, what do charges do? Well, charges, by definition, create electric field We call that capital E everywhere in space around it also. It's not the same thing as a gravitational field, but they are somewhat analogous. And guess what? So in order for this thing to create a gravitation, <laughs> an electric field, it has to be a charge. It has to have a non-zero net charge. We're going to call that charge capital Q. All right. So the strength of this electric field, well, in a analogy to the strength of a gravitational field, it doesn't depend on, uh, well, gravitational constant, that's for sure. It doesn't depend on mass, but the structure is very similar. This gravitation, <laughs> this electric field strength depends on two things. One is the charge of Q, and two is the distance from Q's center. And guess what? This electric field expression has a structure that's very similar to that gravitational field expression. Instead of G, guess what we use? Coulomb's constant. Instead of mass of that object, we use charge of the object. But we still do that. Now, it's also worth noting that, you know, by definition, because we've employed this for a long time. Well, this really says something specific. It says that gravitational field G is by definition the ratio of gravitational force per unit mass. All right? So we can similarly say that electric field E by definition is a ratio of force to, well, not mass, a force to charge and not gravitational force, but electric force, electrostatic force. And thus, we can say that kind of like gravitational force is mg, here we say qe. So if we put a charge q at that location, that charge feels a force. That force depends on how much charge we put there and how strong the field is. Just like if we put this mass here, how much force does that mass feel? Well, it depends. How massive is that object? And how strong is the field that it's in? And check this out. Now we can say, well, because we have this expression for how strong the electric field is, that says that Fe can be, well, this stuff times little q. So that's k q q over r squared, and there's Coulomb's law. Now, here's the deal. What direction does this 
well, it, when I say it, I can mean a couple of things. The, the field, the force. The answer is that depends. All right, we, if we want to know what direction the force is, well, we'd have to know what the relative signs of these big Q and little q are. All right, if we want to know what direction the field points there, we have to go by a convention. All right, just a, an agreed upon convention that a, a bunch of old folks sat around and said, here, two, four, the direction of electric field shall be defined as follows. And here's what you must know, right? Electric field vector points in the direction of the electrostatic force that a small, and here's the really important part, positive You'll see this phrase, a small positive test charge. Test charge. Test charge, the idea is like, it's just a little, it's a tiny little bit of charge. It doesn't do anything. It's just there to feel a force, right? We know that everything, just like saying, well, this mass here, we don't care about the gravitational field that that mass creates. It's just there to feel forces. Yeah, but that's, okay. that's all well and good to sort of say. We do know that every, every, every mass creates a gravitational field, and thus these force pairs exist. But sometimes we just don't bother talking about that. Sometimes we just say, here's a, ma here's a mass. I put it here. What's the force it feels, right? When we want to talk about what electric fields look like, we have to talk about, well, what if I were to put a little... Uh, uh, one of these kind of non-field making, there's no such thing, charge in a field. Now, that charge has to be positive, and if we want to know what the field's direction is, what we do is analyze the direction of the force that that little positive charge would experience. So here's what I mean. Let's say these are, here's the only charge in the universe. My, my dotted line here delineates that these two objects are not in even in the same universe. They're just single single charges. All right, so if I want to know what the field near that positive charge looks like, what I have to do is say, well, let's take a little, don't draw this over here, let's take this little positive charge and let's put it at some different places and let's look at what direction the force would be on this charge at different locations. Well, at this location, the force on this object would look like that. If we moved this thing here, well, then the force on the object would look like that. If we move this thing here, then the force on the object would look like that. And no matter where I put this object, the force exerted on it would be radially away from that positive charge. And thus, by definition, the electric field made by a positive charge points radially away from that charge. Notice that when I'm drawing my electric field, I'm careful to make the electric field lines touch the charge. These are, that is a representation of the electric field made by that charge, right? The field, people will, you know, common kind of like terminology misconceptions is people will say like, well, positive fields repel. Uh, I don't know. Positive charges repel each other. I mean, just bottom line is the field made by a positive charge points away from that charge or fields, electric fields point away from positive charge. Fair enough. If we want to talk about the electric field made by a negative charge, what we have to do is still take a positive charge, place it anywhere around here, and look at what direction uh, the force that this positive charge would experience points. Well, put it there. The force that this thing experiences would point, or does point, that way. Put the thing here, and the force this experiences points that way. Put it here. Oh, boy. Put it put it here, come here, uh, the force, put it here, sure, the force points this way, 
and you get the pattern. And so what that says is no matter where we put a small, again, we have to define the, def, the direction of a field by what would happen to a small positive test charge. So no matter where we put a positive charge, the force exerted on it would be radially, to, oops, radially toward this negative charge. Toward, toward, toward. And notice, again, I'm being somewhat careful to make my electric field lines point, or sorry, touch the actual charge. So there is an electric field made by that negative charge. By definition, electric field lines point toward negative charge. And yeah, guess what? These fields look similar. I mean, they are very similar in structure to gravitational fields. They're not the same thing, but they can be modeled the same way because of their analogous um, behavior. Okay? So, um, be okay with this. Turn it into your brain. Um, for AP Physics 1, this is not necessary. Why not talk about it? Yeah, I agree. Why not talk about it? This is necessary for AP Physics 1. Right? The force stuff we already know, but here's new. But again, analogous, very analogous to gravitational stuff, and this is a must, yes, also. Okay? Okay. So, uh, yeah, sure. There are charges made by, or sorry, electric fields made by point charges. All right. Now, what about fields made by charge distributions or collections of charge um, or multiple charges in the same sort of general area? Well, let's look at a couple of examples. Let's look at an example where we have um, two different, we'll call them one and two, positive charges. What we'll do is look at um, the total field made by these two charges at some various locations. You see those black dots? Those black dots are locations in space. They're not objects. They're not charges. They're not things. They're places. All right? So at each of those places, each of those charges creates a field. And we can represent those fields using our conventions by saying, like, well, here, and you'll see in a second, the field made by charge 1 looks like that. I'm going to label that E1, right? has nothing to do with the fact that e, that charge 2 is there, all right? If you use your hand and cover up charge 2, you see charge 1? You see a location in space? Well, by definition, electric field points away from the charge making the field. So therefore, at that place, the field made by 1 points away from 1. It has nothing at all to do with the fact that 2 is there. Now cover up charge 1 and say, hey, Charge 2 is a positive charge. At this location, there's a field made by charge 2 that looks like that. And if we assume, because I say so, that Q1 and Q2 are the same charge, and that these two distances are the same distance, then guess what? E1 and E2 are the same size. They are, in fact, equal and opposite. And therefore, the net electric field at this location is nothing. And guess what? If the net electric field at that location is zero, what if we were to put a charge here? Well, wouldn't that charge be equally repelled by both of those other charges and therefore feel no net force? Yep, it, it would feel no net force. It really, I mean, it's the same thing as saying because there is no field at this location, there can't be any force, electrostatic force, on that charge. Okay, now, if we look at some other places like this one to the right, well, there's a field made by charge 1 at this location that by definition points radial, radially away from charge 1. There's a field made by charge 2 that points radially away from charge 2. And symmetry says those two fields are the same size. And their up and down components add to nothing, and their two horizontal components add up which is the same thing as saying the net field is the resultant of those two vectors and points to the right. Which is like saying, if I take this positive charge and put it, oh boy, 
and put this charge here, well, it feels an electrostatic force that points to the right. Notice I drew my E1 and my E2 a little bit smaller than I did at the place directly between the two charges because we're farther away than we were before, so the field gets weaker. Uh, I wouldn't, um, you know, concern yourself a ton with doing this accurately, but it's worth, you know, if we can, we might as well. Here's a place uh, top. Uh, let's go below charge two here. Well, there's a field made by um, charge two that looks like that. There's a field made by charge one. Uh-oh, that's not that big. It's much smaller. Well, you know, much. It's a whatever the ratio of distance is there. It's smaller, all right? But it's still away from um, both of those charges. And here, our net field is the resultant of those two vectors, which looks something like that. At this sort of asymmetric location top right, what we get is a field made by one that looks like that. We get a field made by two that looks, I don't know, like that. Definitely smaller than E1. And thus we get a net electric field that is the resultant of those two and it looks like that. Yeah? Here's what I encourage you to do. Take a positive charge and a negative charge and look at the fields or analyze the direction of um, fields made by each of those charges at each of those black dot locations um, and then find the resultant field at each of those two locations, each of those four locations. You will find the following. You will find that the net field looks like this, looks like this, looks uh, um, uh, looks like this looks uh, oh boy this one's tough uh, it's gonna <laughs> look something uh, looks something like uh, like that maybe yeah something like that yeah yeah if you do those carefully now that's if you did this an infinite number of times and said, all right, there's an infinite number of black dot locations in space. What I'm going to do is find, you know, the the two contributions of the field at every one of those places, and then and then get a you know an infinite number of um, of vectors that well then you could find like a general trend that those vectors sort of um, sort of create and then what we could do is that general trend we can turn into what's called an electric field map all right that's you know here's an electric field map it's an easy one but not all of them are, are that simple this one this what's called the dipole field is one that you'll just see a lot and be asked to draw perhaps um, dipole means right two different charges in this case Right. And what we can do is generally say, well, remember, what, what rules do electric field lines have to follow? There are basically two. They have to point away from positive charge and toward negative charge. And so, watch this. This line points away from positive charge and toward negative charge. Hooray. Here's one. Here's another one. Watch this. This field line points away from positive charge oh, and toward negative. Symmetry says there must be a line that looks exactly like that down here. Here's another one. Points away from positive and toward negative. Away from positive and toward negative. Away from positive all the way around, hey, uh, toward negative. Uh, symmetry says there's another one and it comes oh, around here toward negative. Away from positive, well, and that toward negative. That is an electric dipole field. 
All right, what this is really a representation of is what we sort of said back here. Let's look at the two charge contributions to the field at an infinite number of places in space. But boy, is it tiresome to draw an infinite number of vectors. What we're sort of saying is there's a field that looks like this, and then 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 like this, and like this, and like this, like this, 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 this. But who wants to draw all those lines? And we can draw the general trend those lines follow. So don't draw all those, just draw that. But here's what we're showing, right? Let's take one of our black dot locations in space, uh, like, uh, oh, how about here? How about, uh, how, yeah, how about there? Right? Here, and again, let's, this does assume that Q positive and Q negative are the same magnitude of charge. That's why this field is symmetrical. And I mean symmetrical about that axis as well certainly is this one all right if we look at the place in space we've located well there's a field made by the positive charge that looks like that there's a field made by the negative charge that looks like that those fields are equal in magnitude they have symmetry in that their vertical up and down components add to nothing and their two um, left and right components add up and thus here is the net electric field at, at that location what's special about that especially if I draw it carefully what's special about that is that electric field the specific electric field at any single location um, in this map is tangent to the field line all right so like here uh, here I say here the field points in this direction which is pretty much away from that positive charge yeah it is you know why because we're pretty close to that positive charge and pretty far from that negative one so the positive charge is the dominant effector of the field at that at this location but you know what we start to get out here and yeah we're still closer to the positive and and still farther from the negative but now we're not quite as close to the positive. So notice this is not just ra just radially away from the positive charge. It's got some more effect of the negative charge because we're farther away from this positive charge. But in general, right, any location field, the actual net field must be tangent to this general trend line that we're drawing. All right? But when you're asked to sketch the field made by, say, a dipole, you would draw the green one. And you'd be careful that your lines touched the positive and negative charges all right and you'd be sure that your field um, meets the criteria of being away from positive and toward negative there's another one that you'll certainly be asked to draw and or recognize and it comes from uh, uh, the field made by what are called two charged parallel plates and that quite literally means pieces of metal where one of them has a deficit of electrons, that's the positive plate, one of them has an excess of electrons, and guess what, that can be accomplished by yanking electrons off of this one and dumping them onto that one, and you do that by um, putting a battery in here or a, some, source of, um, some source of electrical energy that we can use to move electrons from one place to another. Anyway, here are two charged parallel plates. Yeah, yeah. Now, the field made by these plates. Well, let's look first at the field made by the positive plate. Don't draw yet, don't draw yet. Let's take this charge. Well, this charge makes a field, at least between the plates, that looks something like this, right? Well, what about this charge? This one makes a field that looks something, uh-oh, like that too, right? Here's a location in space here where those field lines can't cross. That's a rule. Field Electric field lines cannot cross each other, right? There are two contributions to the field at that location, the left and right components of which add to nothing, and the net, the net field looks like that from those two charges. And guess what? From every one of these charges, the left and right components of the field add up to nothing. And all you're left with, 
the net effect of all these charges is a field between the plates from the positive charges that looks like this away from positive you would be more careful than me with making sure your electric field lines touch each surface of charge let's not worry about above that plate yet we'll get to that in a second what about the negative plate well in a similar fashion each one of those point charges makes a radial field but the net effect of all the left and right contributions is zero and what we get is a field from the negative plate that looks like this is it that there's like an alternating thing but it's not really that it's just looks pretty it's not it either it just it's easy to draw that way all right now don't draw this because it'll well you'll see why don't draw listen let's look at this space below the negative plate well the negative plate makes a field that points toward negative charge yada 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 the positive plate makes a field that points away from positive charge and guess what guess what the net effect of all these some of them up some of them down fields are the net effect is nothing the field here adds to zero but aren't we closer to the yeah okay we are but here's the deal what we're going to concern ourselves with is a couple of things one we're going to say that this dimension uh, whatever you want to call this this dimension is way bigger than this one all right these will sometimes be called like infinitely long parallel plates or really long parallel plates or parallel plates that are um, way longer their separation is really small compared to their size all right and what they're saying so is there really a field outside sure but guess what it's really small compared to the strength of the field inside the plates so what we can say is the net electric field out here is nothing close enough to nothing also up there nothing but what's great is the structure of the field inside here all right the structure of the field inside especially like in the middle-ish area right at the end what you at the ends what you really do get is some sort of what's called fringing where we get it actually kind of looks like dipole field at the very end so they'll get some curving in the field at the end but we're going to concern ourselves um, up with the field in in this area here in the middle in the oh boy in the middle of those uh, of, uh, of of those plates and what's great about that or what's very different I don't know how great it is but what's very different about that field and say this one is that the lines don't get farther apart what does lines getting farther apart mean well lines getting farther apart indicates for us like here strong electric field out here weak electric field we can see that visually with how densely packed are the lines right well let's go back to our field between parallel plates those lines don't get farther apart or closer together if I was being really careful with these when, when I drew these field lines I bet I can't move just one of them yeah it's gonna move all oh crap Oh no. If I was being really careful, I would have tried to draw every one of those lines the same exact distance apart. All right? And what that means is the field between those plates doesn't vary. And we call that field an a uniform electric field. Meaning the field has constant strength. A lot like another field that you're used to being well that you're used to and that is the uniform gravitational field in which you'll live most of your life I would argue probably the gravitational field in this room is of a strength 9.8 newtons per kilogram right and no matter I, I gotta I have a mass in my hand right now which you can't see but if I raise it up over my head uh, it weighs what it weighs if I put it down in front of me it weighs what it weighs if I put it on the floor it weighs what it weighs 
the gravitational field in this room is of the same strength no matter where I am. Between these two plates, the electric field is uniform. It has the same strength everywhere. And what that means is we could put um, a positive charge here um, or here or here or anywhere we want. And guess what? This, what do you call it, positive charge feels an electrostatic force that big there and that big here and that big here and guess what all those electrostatic forces are of the same exact size because the field is uniform like saying how much do you weigh uh, notice we didn't say well where how high up am I we were where 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 in the earth am I as long as we're saying we're near the surface of Earth, where G is 9.8 newtons per kilogram, you weigh the same amount. There's a uniform field. There's a uniform gravitational force on you. Same thing here. This is a uniform electric field, and thus the for I mean, should I have been more careful of how I drew these electrostatic forces? Probably. They should be the exact same length, of course. Um, so, it's, I mean, this is picky, right? Picky. Clone. Sure, same, same everywhere, good. Okay, so um, it's sort of trivia that the electric field between two parallel plates is uniform, but it's useful in that we can talk about, oh boy, um, we can talk about um, or quantify, therefore, what the, strength of a f what the strength of a force is, and maybe even do like, you know, since that forces of constant strength we could even maybe do like well what if i you know what if i said there's an electrostatic force on something and what does that result in well it depends on the item's mass as well as fe is qe right equals ma and then we could you know start to do some analysis of the motion of an object in that field um because the field is uniform all right so that's a bunch uh, about the basics of electric fields, how they are analogous to gravitational fields, um, and then a few situations in which we can, um, you know, find the direction of a field in simple cases and for more complex cases and in some specific cases that will be of importance to you. Okay? All right. Fairly well.